Thanks. Again, I'm Craig Zillis. I'm from the University of Illinois, and I'll talk about uh, the work we've done with the computer-based testing facility, focusing on effective, secure, and efficient summative assessment. Um, so roughly, I'm going to spend a little time motivating this, why we went and did this. I'll talk about the facility itself, and then I'll talk about some operational details. I'll talk about what exams look like, in particular, uh, the platform we use to run the exams and what's interesting about it. And then some data that we've collected by watching the exams, focusing on uh, student behavior in the pro presence of asynchronous exams and how we use randomization to mitigate uh, strategies that students might use otherwise to get an advantage on the exams. And then I'll show you some data on how increased testing frequency improves learning outcomes. And one thing I want to emphasize is feel free to stop me at any time, because chances are if I'm saying something that seems outrageous to you, there's probably other people that think it's equally outrageous. So please ask questions and make this interactive. Um, so why did we do this? Illinois is a very large engineering school. So we're the second largest in the US. We granted uh, 2,000, over 2,000 bachelor's degrees in 2016. Um, so we have a scale problem uh, in our calculus-based Physics sequence uh, is about 1,000 students per semester. Our data structures class runs routinely at 800 students per semester. And our introductory uh, statics class, what would be 201 here, is over 500 students per semester. And so um, we're pretty good at running these classes at scale. A lot of things scale effectively. You can run more labs. You can run more office hours. Those just scale with the number of students. But a, a particular pain point was running exams, trying to get all of the students at the same place, write brand new exams, printing those exams, proctoring them, not losing them. A big thing is student conflicts. If you have a large class, 10% of your class can't take it at the appointed time. You need to have a conflict or a conflict conflict exam. Dealing with testing accommodations or student illness, and then you have to grade all that stuff, and students don't get immediate feedback. or you need to rely heavily on multiple choice. And for things like design and analysis, that didn't seem like a good fit. It's basically sufficiently painful that faculty don't do it very often. It's pretty common in most courses that have pencil and paper exams, maybe one or two midterms and a final exam. And there's a lot of research to suggest that frequent testing is actually really good for student learning. And so we wanted an assessment strategy that scaled to large populations without reducing quality. Um, because not only are we a large engineering college, we're also a very strong engineering college. And so our solution was the computer-based testing facility. And there's two main pieces to that. One is the ability to build sophisticated computerized problems. Um, so digitizing the things that we want to test. And so uh, my colleague in mechanical engineering built a tool called Prairie Learn, which is a question asking platform that gives more flexibility than I think just about any platform. So in particular, it allows us to randomize parameters and auto grade a, a wide range of questions. And you have complete control of running server side code and client side code. So I'll show you some of those. But basically, it enables us to do numeric questions, symbolic questions, code writing questions. Most of the things that we want to assess as long as there's an objective grading criteria. So if you can write a computer program that says this answer is right or wrong, then it's something that we can run in our platform. In any computer language? In any computer language, yeah. So we we're happy to fire up a Docker container and run your code. So um, like a number of our code writing questions. So I, I teach computer organization. And so one of the things I have the students do is take a, a working uh, processor and add support for an additional instruction. And so I compile their Verilog code, and I run tests against it. And so we've had people do Haskell. We've had people do just about anything that you want. Um, and so we have this rich set of kinds of questions, things that have some interaction through the client, things that uh, do computer programming, symbolic. Basically, if you have the time to develop it, we could support it. So that's part one. And then part two is a secure computer lab. So we took one of our, uh, initially a small room, now we have two larger rooms um, that we've converted over into our computer-based testing facility. So these rooms are proctored 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have uh, privacy screens. The students are free to use any resource on the computer so they can compile code, they can use CAD tools, they can use 
MATLAB, whatever, we provide them a calculator, but we do control the networking on the machine so they can't go access random things uh, on the internet. Um, and we do make sure that when they walk to the computer that they don't have a lot of stuff. They don't have a smartwatch, that they're not using their cell phone, that they didn't bring in pieces of paper. We have security cameras. So basically, it's you with the, the testing materials demonstrating that you know how to do these things. Excuse me. Yep. So where do they put their stuff? Where do they put their stuff? I'll show you in a second. Proctors, so humans that will check IDs and we do randomized seating so the computers have numbers and they'll direct the students, okay, go to this seat when they check them in and begin your exam now and they'll monitor for cheating while the exam is progressing. Is that? Visually. Visually, yes. Yes. Um, so we're in our sixth year now. It started with my class uh, five years ago, so this was just my class. We've been adding about three to four classes per semester. We're running 35 unique classes this fall. Um, the, we run over 50,000 exams per semester. This fall we expect to run 60,000 exams and this fall we have uh, 8,600 8, unique students taking exams in our facility. Um, so we're able to do this at scale um, and we've been doing it for a while so we kind of feel like we have a bunch of the kinks knocked out. And one of the key things is that once you have your content in place, that running an exam is basically effortless for the class. That you upload your content appropriately, you make sure the scheduler has the, re has the exam at the right times, and the students make reservations and they go and take your exams. And so what that means is there's no longer an incentive for you to have a few midterms of trying to pack all your content into uh, you know, one or two midterms in a final that you can do much more frequent testing. And so a common thing at our institution now is maybe short 50 minute exams every two weeks and in the off weeks an optional second chance score. So if you take an exam and you don't do well, you get immediate feedback on what you don't know. You can go away and study and sign up for this optional exam where you can demonstrate, ah, I've gone and remediated what I didn't know please give me a better grade. And so we do some form of partial score replacement for that. And again, this is something that most faculty couldn't imagine before this facility existed. Um, when assessment is cheaper, so we've done a bunch of uh, reaching out to our faculty that use it and sort of how does this affect your, you know, uh, how you go about running exams, so we've seen that many faculty say there's a significant reduction in effort to run their exams and you know they're very positive about the the reduction in grading load. Um, once one faculty member says that this has revolutionized assessment in my course, it is much more systematic, the question quality is much improved and the TAs and myself can focus on preparing questions and improving questions rather than grading. And so one of the key things is that faculty rather than building brand new exams from scratch every semester, they take large question banks, improve individual questions, or extend the question bank um, each semester, you know, sort of incrementally improving rather than starting from scratch each semester. And what we find is that this frees up staff time for higher value activities, that you're, you and your TAs are no longer proctoring and grading exams, you can instead spend your time doing things like actually interacting with students more, making sure they have their questions answered, reintroducing <coughs> writing tasks back into these large enrollment classes or term projects, more open-ended projects in classes that couldn't support them, and spending your time adopting active learning uh, pedagogy. So our goal is to automate things that are improved by automation. So homework systems that give you immediate feedback on whether you understand or not exam systems that let you schedule your exam at a time that's convenient to you, automate those things and free up the humans to do the things that the humans do better than the computers. So our goal is not to, to automate away the residential uh, education experience, it's to put the people where the people are valuable. So, excuse me, yep. so the, uh, the written lab reports and term projects uh, also graded or, or they replaced the... the they're they're, they're, they're what the TAs are grading now. Right. So, so, so anything that's more closed and objectively scorable, we automate that. 
all the things that require judgment, we're having humans do. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little, and, and by all means, continue asking questions. This is fabulous. Um, a little about the operational details, how we keep the place secure, how we deal with testing accommodations, and some idea of cost. Um, just to be clear, I am one piece in this larger puzzle. So Matt West in Mechanical is my main collaborator. He's the author of Prairie Learn. And Dave Musselman is a member of our engineering IT organization who helped us start this up. We now have a full-time coordinator who hires and manages the proctors and is the primary uh, interaction with faculty when they're running exams. Uh, we have additional people doing development. And then uh, I'll show you some data that Binglin, who's my grad student, has, has generated about uh, cheating. And then um, the Mariana and Jeffrey are uh, educational researcher, uh, CS education researchers that have done uh, experiments, some of which I'll talk about in this. Uh, talk also. So just to be clear, we're not the only people doing this. Ron Damara is a faculty member at the University of Central Florida. He has set up a similar thing, slightly different, but they call it the Evaluation Proficiency Center. There's a lot of the same lessons in theirs. Um, in particular, this asynchronous exam. So no longer are we trying to get all the students to take the exams at the same time. Instead, uh, when an exam becomes available, we send an email to a student. There's a link in there. They click on the link. It brings them to a page where they can make a reservation. This shows them all the times that are available, which they can take the exam. Um, the green ones, there's still space. The white ones are full or the, the room's being used for some other reason. So they pick a time and they can continuously reschedule as much as they want. If, they're, if they were going to have their exam at noon and the friend says, hey, let's go get lunch, they can push it back to 3 p.m. That's fine. As long as they show up for the slot that they've made a reservation, we're fine with that. So no interaction with the faculty to deal with conflict exams. Um, when it comes time to take the exam, the morning of, the students are sent a reminder, say, hey, you've got an exam in this room at this time. They should show up at the room 10 minutes before the exam with their, their uh, university ID, where we check that, um, and we assign them a random seat in the room. That means if you and I are taking the exam at the same time, we're probably going to be put into different parts of the rooms. Uh, students store their belongings on racks. So this is just showing the numbers on the machines. Here's the racks. So we just have places for students to store their stuff when they walk in. And we, we have sort of an imaginary bright line, which is like, OK, don't bring your cell phone over uh, into the actual testing area. Is that? Um, we give students blank scratch paper. They aren't allowed to bring in any paper, but sometimes solving stuff on paper is useful, so we provide them scratch paper. Student logs into the computer using their normal net ID and navigates to the exam and waits for the exam to start. Um, we generate a unique exam for the student. The student then answers the questions in whatever order they want, and the exam is graded interactively. Um, many of the exams allow students to attempt questions multiple times. So if you have some numeric entry question, you can give whatever uh, you know, scale of points that if they get it right on the second time, maybe they get 90% and the third time 80% or whatever, you can control that. And then the proctors enforce the time limits and students leave knowing what their score is because it's been graded interactively. Their questions, yeah. How could that be fair? Uh, if students take a, a class in the fall and it's taught by a different person than teaches it in the spring, how could that be fair? Um, it's interesting. So fairness is a fabulously interesting category. And I would say a better way to look at it is there's a lot of existing uncertainty in assessment. So if I teach you this much stuff, this is a fabulous question. Um, if I teach you this much stuff, I typically only assess you on this much. And so you may have spent all your time studying this stuff, and then I asked you about this stuff, whereas the person who studied this stuff is going to have an advantage. It's not that it's unfair because it's, it's randomized. It's just there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so our goal when using randomized exams is just to not increase the net uncertainty significantly. It's just that there's already a lot of uncertainty in the testing process. We just want to make sure we're not much more than's already there. And you're sure that it doesn't? Um, we are sure that we can, after the fact, know whether or not there was a problem. 
So our ends are large enough that for each version of the questions, we get statistics on what the correct rate. And if something's out of whack, you can take action and, and sort of compensate students that maybe were impacted unfairly. And then the next semester, shift your problem pools so that you rebalance more efficiently. So I, I have no magic bullet that says, here's a question. I can predict exactly how hard this question is. I think that problem is really hard. I think the right answer is to do something and then fix problems when they happen. It's a great question, though. Yep. I have a question about number seven and uh, graded interactively. Um, so, are you you're telling students at each question whether they got it right, or if so, how much, or are you reserving that information till the end of the exam? So that's under the student's control. When they enter an answer, they can choose to either save it or can they can save and grade it. At which point they would get immediate feedback. Um, I think this is a super interesting area of study because there's potentially, you know, if you get something wrong, it could it could affect your your mental state. Um, so this is something we I have a student who's actually actively looking at this. Um, we've at times gone back and forth. Most students like to actually do one problem to completion before moving on, just because the context switching of of doing a bunch of things and then coming back and doing a bunch of things is inefficient. Um, but definitely there's one hypothesis is that for, that it actually, for the stronger students, it's better to do, you know, to get the immediate feedback and potentially for weaker students or students with test anxiety, it could be a negative. And so I think it's definitely something worth studying. What do they usually choose? Uh, in general, it's, it's very common for them just to do the exam linearly checking as they go. Um, yep. They have to have it graded before they leave. In other words, they just save their problems and then... If they leave, then it, it, the, the exam will auto-close and, and grade everything at some point. So they could leave not knowing what they did. Interestingly, we've done studies and students would much rather know immediately that we were sort of surprised about this because it's sort of like, you know, do you want reality confirmed or not? And most students are just like, I just want a closure on the thing. Um, and so, so even if, you know, in general, the students really like knowing when they leave and not having to wait a week to know how they did. Yep. Um, so you're not automating time right now? You're not right. And that's, that's partly, yeah, so go, is it? Yeah, just because, I mean, we're able to limit time and it can be automated too. So I was just wondering. Why we don't? Yeah. Um, basically, it's because sometimes something weird will happen and uh, it's much easier to deal with weirdness manually than it is automatically. So weirdness things are, we, you know, we've been operating for five years, things like uh, the campus decides to move the IP address of the MATLAB license server and you know, things like that. Or um, a computer has some sort of failure and we need to move a student from one computer to another computer. Um, we do, so, um, you know, it, it's, in general, it's not a burden, like the proctor's already there. That's one, they, the students have to physically leave the room anyway, so um, we could. It turns out it's just easier to deal with any weird situations if we just have the proctors do that. Yep? So you have to have a, a pretty big bank of possible questions for yeah. each of that. Otherwise, they sort of know roughly what they can tell yeah, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about degrees of randomization. Um, so security is super important. If, if, if people are delegating the responsibility of proctoring their exams to somebody else, they want to be pretty comfortable that it's actually secure. So uh, we start with physical security. We lock the room when it's not in use and it's continually proctored by two proctors. That way, if one proctor is dealing with somebody, the other proctor can still monitor the room. The proctors ver verify identity as students come in. We randomize the seating. Um, our scheduler actually, because we have many exams running concurrently, we try to interleave the students. So generally, the people sitting next to you are taking an entirely different exam from you. And so even if you were to look over, you know, it's like not going to help you. We control the networking on the machine. The, they have different home directories on these machines than they do on the normal computer system. Um, the biggest source of integrity violations are people trying to bring in cell phones and ref, you know, look at them or sneak in bits of scratch paper or write things on their hands. Um, these are things that uh, we have a way that students can report other students, uh, which actually gets used and the proctors notice some of these. And then having the security cameras in the room 
makes it really easy to have these super clear academic integrity violation reports where it's like, oh, here's the picture of the student pulling out their phone. Here's them doing stuff on their phone. Please tell me that you're not using your phone when I have these pictures. Um, so we, we have um, roughly on the order of 20 uh, academic integrity violations per semester. We run 50,000 exams. That's about the amount we'd expect to have if we were catching stuff because you couldn't believe it if somebody said, oh, there's no cheating, you no know, attempts at cheating in our, our, um, our uh, infrastructure. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. Um, uh, we do things like constantly change the color of scratch paper because otherwise people will try to bring in paper and uh, you know pass it off as like, oh, this is just my scratch paper that I wrote stuff on. Uh, what's interesting is that over time, students get more comfortable in a situation and then they begin to, to try new things. Um, so over time, you have to keep seeing what they're doing. Um, but uh, testing accommodations, so uh, students have things where they require extra time or uh, a distraction-reduced environment. The, those are the two most common testing accommodations we have. and so we handle them directly. We have some seats that have uh, partitions, and that's what's required for distraction-reduced environment. We can also provide the students uh, ear phones to block out sound. Um, for extra time, that happens automatically in the scheduler. They bring their, their accommodation letter to the facility at the beginning of the semester. We record it in the computer, and then whenever they make uh, reservations, they just give them the, the, uh, the correct amount of time. Um, and that handles 98% of students with accommodations that we see. Um, we have one wheelchair accessible uh, seat that the University of Illinois is a very flat campus and so uh, we have a lot of people in wheelchairs um, and all of this again is handled in the scheduler. So I as a faculty member don't have to worry about any of this. Um, we work very hard to communicate with faculty what I call Goldilocks style which is just the right amount that uh, things happen, students forget to make, you know, they make a reservation and then they don't show up. I as a faculty member don't want to know. And so a bunch of those low level things or uh, a computer has problems in the middle of an exam and so the students move to another computer and they're given an extra five minutes of time. Fine, I don't want to know. And so we work pretty hard to, to um, build a system where there's a class of things that happen. So we've even had outages, like I said, that the, the MATLAB uh, license server going down. If, if that's not resolved in two minutes, you have to basically send the students away and clear their exams and have them come back. Um, and so that kind of thing, we would notify the faculty member and make sure that they didn't want us to do something uh, specific, but we would still handle that completely for the faculty member. Um, the, the thing that we don't want to have happen is a student to go to the faculty member and said, oh, this terrible thing happened to me during my exam, so you need to make some, you know, give me some points back. And uh, if I'm the faculty member, how am I to understand whether the student is telling the truth or not? And so we have a system where students, if they, if they have some issue about how the exam went, they need to raise that before they leave the CBTF. They basically go to a proctor and say, I have an issue, I'd like it documented. The proctor says what they think happened, the student gets to say what they think happened, and that gets communicated to the faculty member. So when the student comes in and says, oh, I had this problem, you're saying like, yes, you know, you had this problem, let's, let's handle it, and you have all the information that you need. Um, how much does it cost? Um, our biggest expense is staffing, is the proctors and the proctor coordinator. Um, it comes down to that, la uh, I don't remember which academic year this was, but um, our budget, not counting space or lighting or uh, electricity, what came out to be 190K per year. That year we ran about 100,000 exams, and so the price <coughs> per exam was about $2. Yep. Um. How do you deal with domain-specific questions like uh, ambiguity in the wording of the problem? Uh, we tell faculty to not write them. Uh -huh. um, so basically, TAs are not present, yeah. and so the proctors are trained to say, do your best. There is a way in the tool that we use for most of our exams that the students can report questions. Um, this is actually super interesting. So uh, typically, 
The first students to take the exam are some of the strongest students. And so if a question is broken, it'll be hit by a few strong students first. They will report it. You can you know, basically monitor your exam the first couple hours it's running, fix the question, give that student full points for the question because they probably would have gotten full points anyway because they're one of the strongest students. And then the bulk of your class never sees the problem. So it actually works out better in an asynchronous sense than it does in a synchronous sense in that way. But you do have to be a little, if you're using a bunch of questions that have never been used before, yeah. then you should pay attention the first couple hours that your exam is running. But um, the idea is to try to make the test not ambiguous. And that's actually a fairness concern. Because if one student says, how does this, you know, ask the TA, what does this question mean? And the TA explains it, and another student doesn't understand but doesn't ask, you know, you've created an unfairness. And so the fairest thing to do is try to make the exam as clear as possible and then, you know, do your best. Yep? Uh, what if a student misses the exam? Are they allowed to reschedule it? Um, typically, yeah. So uh, that we try to discourage that because that's more of an efficiency problem for us that if people make reservations and then don't show up for them, we lose those seats. Um, but so we, we track how often students do this and we start you know, telling students, it's interesting, we're putting in a policy where basically if that happens a bunch, you don't get to schedule for the last day of the exam. So that's your, your penalty is that you get a, a smaller window of choices. Um, but typically it's fine that, that we just sort of you know, kill the reservation and allow them to reopen the reservation. We may have, we, we typically open, we leave a, uh, an overflow day, so if, if, you know, for example, if the power was to go out, you know, 9 p.m. on a Thursday night and some exams were ending on that Thursday, what we would do is we would cancel the exams for those students and let them schedule into Friday. Um, so we have an extra day that, like, less than 1% of the exams get scheduled onto this extra day because it requires proctor intervention to allow you to do that. All right, so, um, Roughly 2% per exam. So some of our departments used to print these multi-page exams and just the printing cost alone of printing that exam was you know, $1-ish. So it's same order of magnitude of just printing a paper exam. And it's quite a bit cheaper than a lot of what the online proctoring services are charging. Um, so what do exams look like? Um, so this is uh, an example of an exam. So this exam had seven questions, so a 50-minute exam. This is in mechanical engineering. It's on rigid body kinematics. Um, and what you can see is I can navigate to these questions in any order. I'll show you some examples of questions. Uh, each question is worth 10 points, and I have done none of them. And then this is the, the if I get it right on the first time, uh, I get 10 points. And if it's on the second time, nine, then seven, then five, then two, then one. And so a faculty member just decided that that's how this was. So let's take a look at, at some questions. Um, let's start with more natural ones. I teach computer organization, and so uh, this is a question. Given a circuit, give me a Boolean uh, expression for that circuit. And the key thing that our, one of the key things our tool does is it's really good at, oh, golly. Oh, there we go. Good. Um, randomizing questions. So I have a piece of code that uh, builds random expressions and from random expressions it knows how to uh, draw a, a, a circuit for it. And so this circuit is actually being generated dynamically and um, so this is the idea. You make item generators that have generate a wide range of items and then you can use them forever. Rather than each semester writing new versions of the question, write the question once and use it forever and then you can spend next semester's writing you know, different learning objective questions. Um, here's the corresponding thing in mechanical engineering. You know, it's a beam with a bunch of loads on it. And it says how we you know the size of the forces on the various things. And it asks you to compute something. And you can see it's, it's blue, blue, red, red, blue. If I regenerate the question, you know that. Uh, the forces get moved around, so not only do the, the values of the forces get moved, but the, the picture is also being generated dynamically. Um, you'll notice that it provides a block of MATLAB code defining a number of constants. So if they want to, on the exam, use MATLAB to solve this question, they cut and paste it, and then they can write code to solve that. We want to encourage 
our engineers to use computation as a tool to uh, solve their engineering problems. Question. Can the students generate new variants if they find some of them difficult? To so generate? not on exam. So on exam, basically, when the exam is generated, you get a variant. On the homework, typically what we do is um, you get, you're told you have to earn a number of points, and this question is worth so many points, and uh, usually you're required to do it a couple of times, and if you do it and you get it wrong, it will tell you what the correct answer is and allow you to generate a new version. So the idea is homework is for learning. I want you to try it, know that you failed quickly, figure out here's what the correct answer is, see if you can understand why that's the correct answer. Now I'll give you a new version. You can try it again until you've gotten it correct. So the goal of homework is not to evaluate you, it's to help you evaluate yourself and for learning. Um, this is a problem I built for uh, designing finite state machines. So we describe a situation where design a finite state machine that does that. So there's a little CAD tool in the, the browser that lets me you know, uh, design a finite state machine. Um, and then I can run a bunch of test vectors against their finite state machine to see if it behaves the same way that uh, uh, a golden model does. Um, this is an example of a code writing question. There's a, a box to, to evaluate you know, whether they did the right thing. If I return true, you know, I don't actually okay, spend the time to write the question. Um, but then we, we take that code, we ship it off to a machine in AWS, fire up a Docker container, um, run a bunch of test vectors against their code, and that stuff is, is passed back to you so you can see sort of like what your answer was compared to what you know our expected answer for and so we do a lot of randomizing most of the points come from randomizing test cases to prevent me from just hard coding uh, a set of answers um, this is a drawing question where um, you're supposed to design a free body label the free body diagram for uh, something i actually um, the, the, these things you can change the direction of the forces. Um, one of the key ideas is that computers are really bad or, or it's really hard to take some complex engineering problem and auto grade it effectively if, you know, and give partial credit. Um, you know, if they, if they do 17 steps and they get them all right, great, we can say you did it correctly. But if they, if they you know, it's really hard to say like, oh, you deserve 80% of the points because you only missed this one thing. And so what we recommend is that for at least these computerized exams, you break things down and write questions that test individual learning objectives. So the student can, can practice that learning objective and be tested on it and evaluated automatically. And then you use humans to, to grade the things that are integrative across multiple learning objectives. Um, so this is really good for the um, the individual sort of building block skills. This is another uh, problem written by my friend, the roboticist, that he wanted students to get an idea of what this translation and rotation matrix really means. And so he gave them uh, this tool where there's a robot here, and I'm supposed to position the robot um, in the correct uh, position and orientation as specified by that matrix so that I have some visceral understanding about what those numbers mean. So this kind of shows you the flexibility of the tool that, you know, the idea is we didn't want to dumb down our exams just because we were computerizing them. Definitely some of the things I showed you there take a lot of time to build, but the thing is once you've built them, then you can use them for free for the rest of time. Um, so there is an upfront investment to do this, but um, definitely it makes sense um, over time, yep. So can other people also use these tools you built? Can other people, so, sort of open so, so Prairie Learn is open source and some of these things are implemented as elements so um, that uh, Prairie Learn has, um, elements are sort of the building box for questions. So an obvious element is a numerical entry field that lets you control the tolerance of what's a correct answer. It turns out that robot thing is also an element that he did the work to just sort of say, oh, now it's a thing that you can just sort of slap everywhere. And elements are instantiated in questions just like 
uh, HTML tags. You just sort of, you know, here's an here's element and then you give it parameters. Um, the individual course content is owned by that whoever authored it, and typically that's not open source, but shared among uh, faculty. So, you know, I took a bunch of my computer organization stuff and shared it with the corresponding class in the ECE department. Um, but it's not open source because if it was, then at least for homework, people could write Chrome extensions that automatically answered all the questions on the homework, which uh, that wouldn't actually help them on the exams, but it still um, seems like something to discourage. Um, I, I meant like the widget for the halting the, the games. Uh, like so that's code I wrote. If you sent me email, I'd probably share it with you. Right. So yeah. So it's not. Yeah, it's, it's not open source per se because I've been some combination of too busy or too lazy to, to sort of put that into an element. That some things that are sort of like domain specific, you know, people don't go to the effort to, you know, like once you get it working, don't touch it and just, you know, um, yeah. Um, I think there's definitely, you know, I think it's going to be super important going forward to create sort of open source question banks just so that people can share this stuff. And I think, you know, one of the things I believe to be true is that if there's just enough stuff, it doesn't matter whether students have access to it or not. As long as you have a secure way of evaluating whether they're doing the work themselves, then whether they've, you know, if there's a million questions out there, if they studied all million of them, you know, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, all right, so asynchronous exams. We have students taking exams at different times. Uh, almost every faculty's, you know, instant response to that is like, what if they talk to each other? So this is what we call collaborative cheating. And I put cheating in quotes because I don't really think of it as cheating. It's more students are optimizing, you know, the amount of information they have. So here's the situation. Student A takes the exam. They become the information producer. They can then communicate what was on their exam to student B, and that can affect the student B's studying before they take the exam. And so ideally, you want your exam to be resilient to this because trying to stop students from communicating on their own time is basically impossible. I think it's not even worth trying. And so our key solution is, basic, is this randomization. Um, so uh, this is, so people who I talked to early on in the day don't answer this, but um, the first thing is how do students behave? In particular, uh, when do students choose to take the exam? And then second, does performance vary over time? If so, how? Is anybody brave enough to guess when do students prefer to take exams? Most near the deadline, the best earlier. Right. So, so what he said is, is closest to the deadline and uh, the better students take it earlier. And this is, in fact, uh, what we see. So this is, for example, a four-day exam. This is relatively representative. Each dot represents a student. You can see there's many more dots uh, on the last day than there are on the first day. And that if you plot the average score, um, that the average score goes down. This is actually very exaggerated <laughs> over uh, most exams, it's, but it's, it's illustrative of the general trend. Most of them, the slope is, is much more narrow. but Almost universally, we see exam scores go down over time. Um, so we did a big study of this, and this is the slope. So this zero would be if exam performance didn't change over time. And you can see the majority of them is ne are negative. So exam scores do go down over time. Um, the best explanation, and we've, we've mostly validated this using um, some classes have some synchronous element, so either the final exam was still a pencil paper exam or they had some exam or quiz that, that was still synchronous um, that we could use as sort of an anchor of, of student quality. Um, and what we basically believe to be true is that if you're a strong, confident student, you make a reservation whenever it's convenient. And if you're scared, then you put off the exam as far as possible. And you're usually scared because of uh, some reason. So the first thing is somewhat counterintuitive. A lot of people, when they first see this, they assume exam scores will increase over time as more information gets out, but we don't see that. So at least that information effect 
is smaller than this other effect. So not saying that that information effect doesn't exist. All right. But your average is a third of a standard deviation per day. Uh, and so it's like one standard deviation or more over the four days. That seems large. No, this, this isn't per day. This is over uh, change in score with day of exam. I think this is normalized over the whole exam period. Um, standard deviation per exam period. Change in score with day ex of exam. So it's, it's not saying that this is the, the yeah. It's, it's the slope over the whole exam period is, is roughly, you know, not quite half of a standard deviation. Um, yeah, I apologize if that's not worded correctly. Okay. All right. So it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. It's, it's relatively subtle, but um, it's, it's pretty repeatable. All right, so. If you tell students that they'll get a better score if they take the exam earlier. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's actually causal, though. No. Uh, we, we've joked about that a lot. Like, you know, and we actually had some people seriously say, well, can't we just get people to take the exams earlier? It's like, I don't think that's the problem. Um, <laughs> So the second question that we were interested in was um, how much randomness did we, do we need in an exam? And so we did a study where we looked at a set of, of exams in a mechanical engineering class and they were constructed in this way. So there were many of these quizzes throughout the semester and some of the problems, these ones that are circled, were questions that were drawn from the homework. So this was to part encourage the students to, to make sure they understood all the homework problems and so some of the questions on the exam were drawn directly from the homework. And then some of the questions were hidden questions that students had never seen before. And in particular, there was one slot on the exam where all students got the same question, one slot where they got one of two questions, and one slot where they got one of four questions. And so one student maybe got those questions, and then another student got those questions. So when they when they sit down and the exam is generated for them, we're picking from these pools and then parameterizing those questions. So, so all these questions had randomized numbers in addition to those two questions being drawn from pools. So we looked at the data and what we saw was there were some students that uh, during this exam period, so between the time when the first exam was taken, we looked at what problems they went back to the homework system to study. And some students sort of studied everything roughly equally. And there were some students that studied things that happened to be on the exam much more frequently than things that weren't on the exam. And so the obvious inference is that this student had some information about what was on the exam. And so we labeled these people as, again, cheaters in quotes, people that were ex trying to exploit information. And we wanted to know how much better did those students do on the exam um, and so we could break this up by the type of question. So for the inaccessible questions, we'd expect they could do, they would do, um, like their information wouldn't necessarily be helpful. So on average, they were slightly weaker on the inaccessible questions, but on the questions where they all got the same version, there was a 12% advantage. Um, but as soon as you, put the questions into larger pools, that advantage largely disappeared. Um, and there's, I don't totally trust this one because there is a bit of a ceiling effect that this question, the questions that happen to be put in the, the pool size two happen to be easier than the other questions. And so even if there was a lot of cheating and it was beneficial, there's only so much better they could do. Um, so we tend to say, try to have at least three versions of questions. And we've done a little more analysis and it, it seems to be a mix of more versions means it's harder to figure out what all the versions are that you have to talk to more people. And it's just more stuff to fit in your head. So if you're memorizing specific algorithms for solving questions, um, that takes up a lot of space in your head compared to, you know, so our goal is just we want to make cheating more effortful than just learning the material. That's the goal. So I, I don't care about eliminating cheating. I just want to make it unprofitable. So yes, if you're stupid and you want to cheat, 
spend twice as much time. That's fine. You're only hurting yourself. Um, OK, I'm still doing not terribly on time. Um, so last topic are the questions on this. So my rule of thumb is you know, try to have like at least three if, if, they're, if they're sort of like numeric problems or you know, things where we can randomize the parameters, have at least three in a given slot. And then for coding questions, I don't know how to parameterize programming questions. And so I try to shoot for like eight to 12 different versions of a programming question just so that, because the thing is like if you've seen a programming question, you kind of remember the answer. Like it's easier to do a logic puzzle that you've done before than it is to, to do one you've never seen before. Um, all right, so last topic, increasing test frequency, improving learning outcomes. Um, so one of the things that faculty are very positive about is the ability to use small frequent tests. So one faculty member said the CBTF has allowed us to move from a standardized three midterm model to a weekly quiz model. As a result, students are staying on top of the material better. So being forced periodically to do summative assessment means I can't wait six weeks and then try to cram. I have to do the stuff and keep up. Um, students are more participatory in sections because they have not fallen behind. That, that some faculty have commented their classes are more interactive. Students are more willing to ask questions because they're being forced to, to keep up with the material. Um, so we've done two uh, pseudo-experimental studies. So this basically means uh, it's not truly scientific. We, we didn't you know, split the students. They're comparing one class, same class, same instructor, over two different semesters. So there was a semester where they had been doing what they had been doing forever, and then they changed. And so we're comparing that. So the only change in both of these classes is shifting some of the assessment activities to the computer-based testing facility. And in both cases, it enabled either more frequent or more reliable assessment. In both of these classes, they were using an unchanged pencil and paper final. So we didn't look at how much better they did on the quizzes, the computer-based quizzes, because we could have just made them easier. And maybe they did better because they were easier. We basically took the same final for both semesters and looked how, much, how well the students did on that final. And the interesting thing is this final was still being offered pencil and paper. So there's no mode advantage to having taken the midterms on computer. And we think this is a better estimate, this final exam score, than the overall course grade, because there's a lot of things like homework that um, often are effort related as much as they are ability related. Um, so one of these studies was in uh, our introductory solid mechanics class. Uh, so the equivalent of, I think, oh, it's been too long, 2.30? Um, so they took, they used to have two pencil and paper midterms. They replaced those with five quizzes and then had five second chance quizzes. So roughly the same amount of content because these were two hour exams. These are 50 minute quizzes. Those are optional. Um, what you see is this is with pencil and paper. This is the control semester. This is the number of students that got D's or F's on that final exam, uh, more than half. And we saw a corresponding increase in the number of students that got A's on the final exam. Yay, that's what we like to see. Um, 421, uh, they did something different. They, uh, they converted two midterms to the computer paced uh, testing facility. And uh, instead of collecting submissions on four of the programming assignments, they instead had the students go to the CBTF and write a, a randomly selected part of that programming assignment. So, you know, if you, if you had done it, you should be able to come back and redo a little bit of it in this secure environment. Um, so what did they see? Again, uh, the light gray is the control semester. So they saw, again, a corresponding reduction in the numbers of Ds and Fs. They didn't see an increase in the number of As. They just saw a redistribution of those scores into Bs and Cs. Um, so not quite as striking, um, but again, uh, having students uh, perform poorly is, um, you know, this, is, this represents a huge saving of resources of, of students that are not going to retake uh, a course. Yeah, these are, well, so these aren't necessarily failing the course. 
it's getting a failing grade on the final, which may, um, or a D on the final. Still, it's, it's not, right, so um, serious classes. Um, so my last topic is second chance testing. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, what we find is that, especially for like first generation students and students that are um, uh, lesser prepared, one of the hardest things is understanding the exam expectations. You can go into an exam saying like, I think I'm ready for this exam, and then you, know, you get crushed by it. Not because you were unwilling to do the work, but you just didn't understand the expectations. And so what we're doing is effectively running the exams twice and then doing partial uh, grade replacement. And so uh, what we see in general is this tightens the, the mean score, uh, improves the mean score and tightens the distribution. This graph's a little hard to read, but the yellow and the purple part of the graph represent the scores that this class would have had on exams or the distribution if there weren't second chance e exams. And then the blue and the purple together is the distribution you get after you um, give access to these second chance exams. And so again, this is sort of typical of what we see is it, it pulls in the tail quite a bit. That uh, Some of these people that were struggling before get shifted up and, and you know, over into um, the people that are doing well. So this is out of 65 because 65% 65 of the final grade was, was from things that were on exams. Um, so the, the most important thing to do about, to know about this if you were interested in doing it is you can't do full grade replacement. That if you say the second chance exam is uh, that if you do 100% on the second chance exam, you get 100% because uh, students are optimizers. And so what the, many of them will do is they won't study for the first exam and then some of them won't even take the first exam. And they'll just be like, oh, well, I have another chance. And so that, that's the real exam. Um, so it's, it's really important to put some weight on the first chance exam. So in, in that course, which is the course I teach, um, I say if you want to get Basically, we cap this, the second chance exam scores to 90%. So if you want to get better than a 90%, you have to do it on the first chance exam. Um, so that's one strategy. Another strategy is uh, that's used by mechanical engineering is a one-third, two-thirds, that your exam score is one-third of your first exam score plus two-thirds of the max of the two scores. So if you do better, it helps your grade. If you do worse, it doesn't hurt you. Um, we've, we've been playing around with that, but I think the key thing is you, you can't just let people put it off because students are busy. If they can put something off, they'll focus on their other classes to the detriment of their performance in your class. So my last slide, um, our computer-based testing facility is now a fixture in our College of Engineering. It makes testing more efficient and more effective for learning. Um, we're mature operationally, we're secure, we're running at production scale. Uh, it's well liked by faculty. Uh, we give faculty no incentives in general to develop content and adopt this platform. It is a lot of work to build content. Faculty do it anyway because they see the value. I no longer, for the classes I do this, write brand new exams. It's an enormous time saving now that I have that content. But it does involve that per course upfront investment in digitizing content, at least until we have large open source uh, banks of, of questions. We're also happy to share our experience. That, like, this is something that I think there's a lot of institutions that would benefit. Um, so happy to have conversations about how to do that here if it's something that you would be interested in.